טוב, שלום לכולם. Uh, מכיוון שהסימפוזיון הזה מתקיים באנגלית, אנחנו נעבור ישר לאנגלית. Uh, I'm happy to open this symposium, the first of a new series of webinars on biodiversity and sustainability. It's a new series of symposia which aim to bridge the gap between cutting edge international science and its implementation in the protection, management and sustainable use of the ecosystem. We hope the webinars become a platform for open discussion of contemporary scientific issues and their application and contribute to the development of conservation science in Israeli academia and cutting edge practices in the responsible resource agencies. We're particularly happy that our partners in the series are the Ministry of Environmental Protection, the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, Keren Kayemet Israel or JNF or Israel's Forest Service, and the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel on the one hand, and on the other, colleagues from all Israeli research universities who are committed and dedicated to varied aspects of conservation science and education. Because of changes in her schedule, uh, you do have to remember, we have an election in a few days down the road, member of Knesset Gila Gamliel, the Minister of Environmental Protection, had to taper opening words ahead of time, and we will hear them now. Stas, please. Honorable guests, dear friends, on the morning of February 17th, hundreds of tons of tar arrived at Israel's Mediterranean coast, covering 160 kilometers. The tar killed sea turtles and marine birds, polluted the sandy and rocky beaches. We estimate that a spill will continue to corrupt the Mediterranean's natural marine ecosystems for many years to come. All of the above could have been prevented if the world would have been unaddicted to its use of fossil fuels. One has to understand that this incident is more than a tragedy, but rather a wake-up call aimed to implementing and using renewable energies. We have a goal of 100% carbon pollution, free electricity by 2035. The state of Israel, as a very sunny country, has to ambitious goals in order to increase its renewable energy use. We should use Israel's advantages to develop new and groundbreaking technologies. For example, Israel is incubating some of the most promising climate technologies, from renewable energy storage to robotic panel cleaners. To explain how big the potential is, Israel's southern region, Elat and the Arava, is the first region in the world today that is powered 100% by the sun during the day. We have achieved this 100% daytime solar milestone not in 2050 or even 2030, but today and by 2025, this entire region will be the first region in the world that will be powered night and day using energy storage. We are also solar light unto the nations, bringing green energy access to the developing world. Israel is already a leader in bringing solar power to the most vulnerable of communities. Solar energy is the energy of peace, which can bring our region together and brighten up the lives of our people, as the potential of expansion exists in the Abraham Accords. I would like to mention an initiative included in the Accords which my ministry is promoting, Desert Tech which builds on Israel's extensive experience in adaptation to drylands and desert conditions. With the new peace agreements, we are planning to collaborate with countries in our region and beyond, which are facing these common challenges in developing new technologies and tailor-made solutions to the challenges of the desertification. Oil spills should be a problem of the past, as a major path of the zero emissions goal, the world is switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Even under the most optimistic scenarios, fossil fuels phase out will take time. And in the meanwhile, we have to make sure we are prepared in the best way possible 
to deal with all spills and reduce their devastating outcomes. Such preparedness demands scientific knowledge produced by research. Today's webinar is a step towards increasing Israel's ability to address such challenges. By combining our knowledge, our vision, and our values, we can lead to a greener and healthier future for our generation and for future generations. Thank you very much. Our focus in this webinar series is the ecosystem, of course, and the Steinert Museum is home to the dynamic record of marine biodiversity of Israel and a large team of experts in varied marine taxa who are key to monitoring the complex anthropogenic impacts on marine biodiversity. And the Eastern Mediterranean faces complex challenges that include a huge biological invasion through the Suez Canal, climate change, fishing, and the development and many and diverse infrastructures. And now a major oil spill. So we thought it fitting to organize a first webinar on oil spills in the marine environment. And we are very privileged to have a distinguished and experienced international scientist join us and share their professional expertise. The symposium will comprise three sessions. The first with our international speakers, the second with Israeli experts who will outline the local situation. And finally, in the third session, the international experts will respond to the issues raised in the second session, discuss the current challenges, and also respond to questions from the audience. So you're very welcome to write questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function please, and we will collect them and raise them in the discussion in the final session. And I'm particularly happy to invite Mr. Shaul Goldstein, the CEO of the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, to chair the first session. Shaul, the floor is yours. That was great. <laughs> Every time this happens. So thank you, Tamar. And thank you the, for the Minister for Environmental Protection, Gila Gamil, for the introduction. I have to say that uh, for us, it's very, very important, this symposium that you organized, mainly because of uh, the schedule that is very close proximity event itself. So we can learn a lot during cleaning up. Before we start the session of international experts, I would like to provide you with a little background information an update sure. of the oil sure. camera. Sorry? We can't see you. You can't see me? Your video is off. No, my video is on, of course. But uh, let's check it out. Just a minute. My face is not that nice, so... Uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Tamar, it's your problem, not mine. I'm trying to open my... Uh, oh, now it's okay. That's okay. better? Yes, that's fine. So, uh, again, uh, before we start the session of the national experts, I would like to, to share with you the background information and that of the oil spill from our perspective. Uh, the oil spill began Wednesday, February uh, 20th. A severe storm occurred along the coast of Israel with waves over six meters high. On a regular supervision walk along the shores, INPA rangers and civilians reported of tar on the beaches. We didn't have any alert before. After a wide survey that we took, we understood that we had been hit with an oil spill on a scale we have never seen before. Fortunately, or maybe fortunately, we have had some oil spills in the desert in the past few years with two large chemical spills uh, on land. Uh, so we knew the basic approach dealing with such disaster. <coughs> in the first step, we deployed the work teams along the beaches. And now so far, uh, joined to that, about 15,000 volunteers uh, to clean up the coasts. And I think it's very uh, nice civilian uh, initiative. With the assistance of the Israeli army, now we are trying to develop new tools to ease the jobs of collecting 
tar particles and as well as removing the tar from the areas. We are concerned of methods that might cause more damage than good, thus anxiously waiting to learn from you from this symposium how to ease this long and demanding process. <clears throat> I want to thank to, uh, Professor Dayan and the staff of the museum for organizing the symposium so that we can learn from the experience of experts from around the world about handling this crisis correctly. I'm thankful to the experts from around the globe who are willing to share their knowledge and experience. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this session, Professor Frank von Hippel, <coughs> who is a professor of environmental health sciences and the head of the One Health Research Initiative at the University of Arizona. Professor von Hippel conducts research around the world uh, looking at eco ecology and human health with a focus on indigenous population. Please, Professor. Thank you very much. And I'll just share my screen. So thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I'm an ecotoxicologist, but I do not work on oil. So really I'm here to provide some context for the other speakers today by telling a little bit about the history and consequences of oil spills around the world. And what I wanted to do to illustrate this is just talk about a couple of spills in the United States that kind of give some general themes of some of the issues that we seem to, to see over and over again uh, in oil spills. And the first spill that I wanna just mention briefly is the Santa Barbara spill that occurred at the end of January in 1969. Uh, this was at the time the largest oil spill in US history. It, it was a spill of about 7.6 million liters of oil. And initially by February 5th, you can see the extent of the oil spill along the coast near Santa Barbara um, with the spill eventually reaching all the way up to San Luis Obispo in the north and San Diego in the south. And uh, this, this spill is important for a few reasons. One is that it was the largest in U.S. history by that time. Um, but the second one was that it came on the heels of a series of environmental disasters in the United States. And it was the last of these disasters that then gave rise to the critical environmental legislation that really forms the backbone of American environmental policy to this day. So we saw a series of important acts passed after this due to public outrage. Uh, and we saw the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. We just had a whole uh, in, in renaissance of environmental protections that occurred uh, following this spill. And I just want to mention that this was actually kind of important for me personally because I happened to spend 1974, um, even though I'm from Alaska, we, we spent 90, part of 1974 right at the edge of, of the center of this spill uh, when I was a kid. And uh, we found tar balls all along the beach and my father explained to me what, what had happened. And it was the first time I learned about an ecological disaster. And then I ended up going into ecology. So oil spills played a role in my budding interest in this area. Uh, so what are some of the themes that we see? What you can see here are, are volunteers and workers who are spreading straw along the beach uh, in California to try to soak up the oil and then to bag and remove the oil using straw. Um, but as I look across the variety of oil spills, I see a number of things that seem to crop up over and over. One is that oil spills are political. There always seems to be a heavy political element both to what happened and to, the, and to the consequences afterwards. Oil spills are personal. The people who live there are personally deeply affected and, uh, and they carry that with them. Oil spills, of course, are ecological. This is the biggest issue is the ecological devastation that occurs. They're economic. And so, for example, in California, there were severe economic consequences for a lot of different uh, businesses and people along the coast for many years. It's about people's health. You can see here that these uh, cleanup crews are not wearing personal protective equipment and 
Uh, many, many people get sick from this, from the volatilized hydrocarbons that come off the, of the oil or the tar. We see this kind of consequence over and over. Oil spills are long lasting and the ecological effects can extend for decades and the economic effects and the effects on people's lives can extend for decades. Oftentimes they involve faulty or damaging cleanup that leads to its own set of problems. And you'll hear more about that today from other speakers. Oftentimes they involve fake assurances of safety before the spill by the oil industry or by the government regulators and oftentimes cover-ups afterwards as people are trying to cover themselves for what happened on their watch. Often they involve negligence and incompetence. So all of these occurred with the Santa Barbara spill. Um, they neglected to use required um, tubing to handle the deep sea oil drilling. They provided assurances that, that were meaningless um, when people were concerned about the safety of drilling offshore of California in a sensitive area. They tried to cover up the, the spill as soon as it happened and, and downplay how big it was and how important it was and so on. Oftentimes the people involved have conflicts of interest which further make the damages continue and the, and the political fallout continue. This is uh, President Nixon in the center visiting the spill um, the month after the spill, trying to learn more about what was happening. And I just bring this in to show the, com the political components of it um, because there are quite dramatic political components. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about um, is the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska. And I bring this up just to illustrate how it's personal. So I was born and raised in Alaska uh, this is our boat that we had when I was a kid. That's my father on the back of the boat. And uh, we spent a lot of my childhood in Prince William Sound. So I got to know Prince William Sound really well. I would say it was the most beautiful place on earth. I may be biased, but incredibly beautiful place. And in 1989, the Exxon Valdez, um, under, the, under the direction of a drunk pilot, crashed into a reef and spilled 42 million liters of oil into Prince William Sound, which then spread all along the southern, south, south, south central coastline of Alaska in one of the richest biological areas of the world. And all of these themes played out in the Exxon Valdez spill. It's political, so before the spill, um, the environmental groups calling for spill equipment uh, to be put in place, to be ready in case of a spill, were ignored. The state legislature was awash in money from the oil industry, so they failed to implement strict standards that should have been in place prior to the spill. Um, they didn't do basic safety things around escorting tankers or making sure that the tankers were safe. And, uh, and of course, we had um, drunk driving occurring on one of the most dangerous vehicles the world could ever know. Uh, it's personal for all of the people involved. Um, so in Alaska, we have a, a lot of native tribes and they were deeply affected by the spill. Uh, the fishermen lost their livelihoods. Um, the, you can see uh, the cleanup crews as they were affected. They're not wearing enough personal protective equipment and they, many suffered long-term health consequences from that. Um, the, the, uh, just generally the communities along this entire zone of the coast were personally affected. Um, to this day, I've not bought a drop of Exxon gasoline since this happened. So it just shows you how strongly people feel about these things occurring in their communities. It's ecological and, um, and so the impacts on, the, on this area were huge. We lost hundreds of thousands of seabirds, incredible marine mammal diversity, all the way down to the basis of the ecosystem getting severely damaged. It's economic, the fishery, fishery, which was one of the most productive in the world, collapsed because of the Exxon Valdez. It's people's health. Um, and in this case, these workers are not in the proper protective gear and they suffered health consequences. The, the cleanup was faulty and damaging, which you'll hear about today. So they did a tremendous amount of damage to the ecology in the process of cleaning up the spill. Um, we had the same issues of fake assurances of safety before the spill. and trying to cover up some of the issues afterwards. It involved negligence, of course, and incompetence and conflicts of interest. And he, here we are in 2021, and you can still find a lot of oil in this area. Um, we still have fisheries that have not recovered. 
some of the wildlife has not fully recovered. It did lead to the 1990 Oil Pollution Act, which you'll also hear a little bit about today. Just to put this bill into context for Israel, each one of these lines represents the entire length of Israel from Elat to Lebanon. So this spill zone along the coast is two Israels long. And then finally, just to show you how this relates to the size, Exxon Valdez was the largest oil spill in the United States when it occurred in 1989. Um, how did it relate to the size of the Deepwater Horizon spill? That was much larger, 800 million liters. So you can see the geographic extent of the, of the Deepwater Horizon spill as of um, shortly after the spill and, um, and the context. I also just wanted to mention in terms of ecological damage, one of the features that's often uh, neglected by people looking at these spills, they focus on the seabirds, they focus on the marine mammals, they focus maybe in the case of Israel on the sea turtles, things like that, which are very important, but often ignore the nearshore ecosystem, the basis of that ecosystem. And nearshore ecosystems derive a lot of their physical structure from the organisms themselves in estuaries and mangrove forests, coral and oyster reefs and coastal marshes, seagrass, kelp beds. A lot of times it's the organisms themselves that provide the structure upon which that ecosystem is based. And if those organisms are killed by the oil or damaged by the oil, it can have cascading effects across the marine food web. And another issue to consider is the time lag to recovery, which can be decades. And, and one has to really think about that in terms of, of the commitment to the monitoring and the ecological assessment that has to occur uh, for restoration after a spill. Uh, so my last slide is just to put these themes in context for Israel. So it's political and uh, you guys are familiar with political problems given your elections every few months. It's personal um, and you have many people who are personally affected by the spill in Israel. It's ecological, and this is the biggest issue that I think Israel needs to really focus on. It's economic, people's livelihoods will be impacted by this spill for a long time. People's health, so uh, you need to consider are people wearing proper personal protective equipment who are involved in the spill and considering all these volatized chemicals that they're being exposed to, which are quite dangerous. It's long lasting. Um, you want to hopefully avoid a faulty and damaging cleanup, which is part of the reason for today's symposium. Um, and then I don't, we don't know enough about this spill yet, but just consider based on our past experiences, were there fake assurances of safety in this zone? You guys are developing offshore uh, oil and gas. So do you have proper safety measures in place for that to avoid problems in the future? Um, and are, is information being covered up? Is there negligence and incompetence involved? In most cases, there's a lot of negligence and incompetence with these things. So to make sure that you have assurances that are real and not, uh, and not uh, conflicts of interest that may affect it. And you live in a much more complicated neighborhood than we do in Alaska. So, uh, so all of these problems might be even more intense in Israel than they are uh, for, for many other parts of the world. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and, and I, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was very, very interesting. And uh, the magnitude of uh, the, the oil spills around the world is much bigger than Israel. Some uh, the sequences are very significant to Israel. Our second speaker today is Professor Stephen Murawski, Murawski who is a fish, fishery biologist specializing in population and eco ecosystems dynamics. He had served as a director of the scientific program, a chief science uh, advisor for the National Marine Fishers, Fisheries Service of NOAA, uh, which is a very experienced organization, and he was principal scientific advisor to the U.S. government during the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Subsequently, he assessed the long-term environmental impact of that spill. Professor Morowski was a, a principal investigator for the Center for Integrated Modeling and Analysis of the Gulf Ecosystems, a multinational oil spill research group. Also, 
פרופסור אוף ביולוגיקל ביולוגרפי at the University of South Florida and he is a recipient of the Senior Executive Service uh, Meritorious Service Award uh, conferred by the President Obama among many other professional recognitions. Please, uh, Professor Morawski. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. Shalom and happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully you all can see that. So what I'd like to do is amplify a little bit on the, um, the themes that uh, Dr. Von Hippel talked about a little bit. Um, I'd like to dig a little deeper in some of the technical details and certainly some of the um, response um, mechanisms for three what I would call iconic oil spills. Uh, the, the Deepwater Horizon, which uh, has already been talked about. Ixtoc 1, which was a... Um, a production well blowout in, in Mexico, and the Exxon Valdez spill. There we go. So Exxon Valdez, 1989 in Alaska, that was a classic tanker accident. Um, Ixtoc 1 was a production well uh, in the Campeche region of the Gulf of Mexico, and it occurred for nine months. It, it, it didn't, wasn't capped for nine months between 1979 and 1980. You can see um, fire on the top of the sea there. It was a relatively shallow production platform at about 54 meters, and so um, it was a combination of, of natural gas and oil, and because the natural gas was not uh, dissolved into the seawater at sh shallow depths, it actually came up as natural gas and it could be lit on fire. And by lighting it on fire, you also consume some of the oil. The Exxon Valdez, uh, on the other hand, was a different accident. This is, was a drill ship. So um, it was in the process of completing an ultra deep well in 1500 meters in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and uh, because of a gas um, hiccup in the, in the pipe, um, basically, the blowout prevented, um, for a variety of reasons, didn't work. It was a 21-inch pipe, um, and that oil spill lasted for 87 days. So um, what can we learn from th three very different accidents relative to the situation that the Israelis are confronting now? One thing that we have to realize is that all large oil spills are idiosyncratic, and that is there's no one uh, playbook by which you actually um, can respond to the circumstance of an oil spill um, because they are so different in terms of a variety of features, uh, including the oil itself, um, the, the physical setting, the ecological setting, and the social setting. That is what issues are important to people. And so I wanna try to emphasize that in the time I've got today. So just a little bit more detail on um, the two spills in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the deep water was, um, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting today because, we, you know, we talk in different units of measure uh, with oils. Um, Frank talked about liters. Um, you know, of course, we're in the United States. We don't believe in the metric system. So we talk about millions of gallons, and this also converts to tons. And I actually think that's relevant because uh, uh, ton, these are metric tons. So Deepwater Horizon was about 700,000 metric tons, which is an enormous spill, obviously. Um, the Xtoc 1 platform was about 470,000 tons. Um, you can see some of the details. These are actually um, satellite views of the oil sheen on the surface. And you can see that Deepwater Horizon had a very large footprint. It also had a subsurface footprint, which, which was even larger. Um, the uh, Xtoc 1 spill, you can see it started in Mexico, but actually... Um, over the nine months when it ran, you can see that it drifted up to the Texas coast, which um, is an important aspect because, you know, oil spills do not know international boundaries. And so um, this uh, requires that we coordinate more, particularly if they're on the, the, the edges of, of marine boundaries between the territories of different nations. And, and this is certainly a planning issue that uh, we're more into now because of the consequences of these larger uh, oil spills. So the Exxon Valdez tanker was, um, it, it, again, if we put it in, in tons, it's about 37,000 tons. And as Frank said, 
you know, extended over a very long uh, uh, coastal area. This is a cleanup ship um, with booms around it. And you can see something about the, the uh, rocky beaches there. These are black volcanic beaches, very much different, I think, than the Israeli beaches and, and certainly the Gulf of Mexico beaches. So again, these, these, these issues are idiosyncratic. I wanted to talk a little bit about why oil spills are different and related to oils themselves. So obviously oil is generated throughout the world. The one thing about um, oils that we know is that no two uh, oils uh, from, uh, from different formations are exactly alike. They have a, a lot of differences in them and that dictates a lot about what we can do in terms of cleanup uh, operations. To, so to take this uh, to a little more detail, we can classify crude oils on two different metrics. One is called the API gravity, which is an index of how dense the oil is. And generally you hear about oils being either heavy or light. Um, so a heavy oil would be at an index of about 10. And 10 is an important number because that's basically the density of seawater. So if you see these Venezuelan oils up at a, um, an API gravity of a, a, a little bit more than 10, these are just at the point when they would actually sink. And in fact, there are some oils in the world that are heavier than water, um, so-called dilbit. And that dilbit would, it becomes a very difficult um, um, oil to clean up in an aquatic environment because it sinks to the bottom. Um, that's contrasted with very light crudes. Uh, in this case, the Norwegian and Australian crudes are, are quite light. Um, some of the um, benchmark crudes that we see in the world today are like Brent um, crude, uh, which is uh, one of the industry standards. You always see the price on it. That's a, a, very, a relatively light oil. The other metric on the, on the x-axis here is um, um, the percent sulfur in the oil. And so so-called sweet oils are, are basically very low sulfur oils and sour uh, oils are uh, relatively high sulfur content. And I put this, um, I put this envelope here to, just to, to illustrate that um, for the sake of argument, Iranian crudes are, tend to be on the relatively sour side and they tend to be um, uh, relatively heavy. Um, and they, they basically have a range because of the, um, the individual formations that they occur. Now, this is important for a whole variety of reasons. One of the things is um, heavy crudes cannot be dispersed with chemical dispersants. And one of the um, uh, oil spill response measures I'll talk about is the use of chemical dispersants. Uh, and and so, th so that's important as well. And also um, the lighter crudes tend to volatilize more easily, that is, they become airborne uh, in the presence of UV radiation and sunlight. And so they basically evaporate into the, uh, into the, uh, into the air, which creates issues for air breathing um, uh, vertebrates, uh, sea turtles, marine mammals, and people. Uh, but it also tends to get rid of the oil. Uh, so, so understanding what oil you're dealing with is extremely important in terms of looking at the toolbox of the available things you have. So in, in the talk, um, in the remaining part of my talk, I want to talk about uh, operational components and response options in oil spills. Um, what do we need or want to know about for effective oil spill re response and hopefully ecosystem recovery? What have we learned from those spills that is generally applicable in the current situation? And I want to also suggest that there are some other resources that might be available to you all. So, um, in terms of what we call the tempo of oil spill related activities, there are really three major phases. Once the number one is the response phase. And, and generally speaking, that lasts for, for months to years. The response phase is basically the cleanup. Um, the, the first goal of the response phase, of course, is to, uh, in the case of a, a, a blown out um, production platform, cap the well. In the case of a tanker, um, cap the tanker, remove it from the ecosystem, pump out the oil, etc. Second phase, of course, is cleaning up what's been, been spilled. And that's easier said than done and more complex in more complex habitats. Um, actually, all things considered, uh, sandy beaches are probably one of the easiest places to clean up. Things like uh, coastal wetlands, salt marshes, etc. are the very most difficult. And, the, and in the deep sea, 
um, where oil can reside from well spills, it's impossible to clean up. So the second phase in this um, set of activities are the so-called damage assessment phase. And that is what, uh, what damage did the oil spill cause? And the damage assessment can be both to the ecosystem and to the, um, the economics of the region. Um, in many places, because of limiting uh, public's access to resources, that creates you know, short-term economic problems. It also creates, it creates a number of mental health issues um, that certainly we've seen with large oil spills in the United States. It creates uh, uh, community uh, economics that become dislocated from, particularly if they're resource-based. Uh, and so the, this can actually um, take months to years to actually get a handle on the totality of damage assessment. And the third, of course, is the ecosystem and economic recovery phase particularly if it involves active um, reco ecosystem recovery versus passive uh, ecosystem recovery. Um, actually, decades can extend to centuries in some cases. So I wanted to um, highlight a couple of things about the USA situation. In the United States, as Frank said, um, after um, the Exxon Valdez spill of 1989, that resulted in a piece of federal legislation called the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And that prescribes um, uh, how oil spills are responded to. Um, in terms of um, oil spills, um, they're also um, underwritten by something called the Clean Water Act of 1992, which also Frank noted was an outgrowth of the Santa Barbara spill. It's the obligation of the responsible parties, or the RPs, to clean up, and they are generally assessed fines for violations of the Clean Water Act and other laws. Um, so what happens is the U.S. Coast Guard um, is the quarterback um, or the, the, key, the key entity in directing the cleanup because they can marshal both government resources and the resources of the responsible party. In the case of Exxon Valdez and Deepwater Horizon, these are two massive companies that have GDPs almost as, as big as some countries, right? Um, it costs BP over $60 billion dollars to number one, uh, clean up as best as they could uh, and um, uh, compensate for the lost economic opportunities and pay about $20 billion to the US government fines. So um, big oil spills can be extremely costly. Um, if you don't have a responsible party that has the economic resources, then this becomes the obligation of the government, which becomes much more problematic in terms of raising enough funds to actually do this job adequately. So, so what are the tools of, of, uh, of oil spill response? The biggest tool we have, believe it or not, is something called natural attenuation. And that is over time, oil is a biological product. It will degrade and it will weather um, into more neutral compounds. And this occurs as it volatilizes into the air and it occurs as microbes basically eat it. And, uh, and, and turn it into it, its components. And so natural attenuation uh, is increased in warm weathers and places where um, there's more active um, uh, uh, turnover of the oil products, that is, uh, you know, um, beaches and other places. And natural attenuation is very low in quiescent waters and also where it's very cold. Um, mechanical recovery at sea, this includes skimming vessels um, and, and other appropriate um, entities uh, for offshore um, oil spills in situ burning, uh, booming. Uh, it also facilitates mechanical recovery and in fact, booming, and I'll show you a picture. Um, beach grooming using machinery. Um, there's a lot of machinery that's been developed to, to do this more efficiently than having people pick it off the beach by hand. Uh, beach grooming comes with the impacts of the machinery itself on, on biota. Uh, and then, of course, we have hand recovery. Um, it's, it's appropriate for beaches. It's almost impossible in wetlands. Um, the use of chemical dispersing agents or so-called dispersants is highly controversial. In the United States, they're not allowed to be used within three nautical miles of the coast. Um, uh, the the uh, theory of the use of chemical dispersing agents is that you break large droplets into small ones, which are more easily digested. And the last one is more or less an experimental one, and that's active bioremediation. 
And in many places, um, you have oil um, eating bacteria that are uh, there and waiting for a food supply, which is the oil. But in, in some situations, it may be that um, if we actually facilitate um, the um, development of, of large quantities of these oil eating bacteria, that they can actually uh, improve um, the situation by actively degrading the environment. So bioremediation is a possibility in some areas, but I can tell you it's not been used widely. So just in terms of an illustration of some of these concepts, in order to do a control boom, you have to have oil that's thick enough. And in order to do that, what you do is get something called fire boom, which is basically a, a boom situation where uh, it won't actually uh, light fire. And so it's the oil is corralled into several millimeters thick or, or, or thicker by two vessels that work the boom, and then it's lit on fire. Um, this ha also has consequences because you create air pollution and you also create heavy uh, burn products that go to the bottom, which can actually be quite um, toxic. Um, the dispersants are generally um, applied uh, through aircraft, although during deep water there was a novel use of um, subsurface injection right into the blown out well, um, very controversial. So in terms of um, the general spills, these are some of the, some of the uh, oil spill countermeasures that we normally see. At the sea surface, you see uh, sand berms created, and that is um, sand that's piled up along the shore to create uh, a barrier uh, for um, uh, the oil coming uh, uh, up, 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 the, uh, up the barrier uh, beach, um, skimming, uh, burning at the surface and aerial dispersants. Um, when you get deeper, the number of tools that you actually have becomes more important, more, more difficult. In the Deepwater Horizon scenario, we saw something that doesn't make logical sense to, to scientists, and that is um, you would think that uh, all oil comes to the surface eventually, and that may be true, but um, we also saw a return of oil to the deep sea through the, um, the phenomenon of oiled marine snow. Marine snow is, um, a, um, is, is basically dead biological products that slowly sink to the bottom. Uh, if they become oiled and they also have a little bit of ballast from uh, clay particles, they can accumulate on the bottom. And in, in the case of Deepwater Horizon, we termed it the, the dirty blizzard. It was a tremendous amount of oiled marine snow that hit the bottom. So one of the techniques that, that uh, government agencies in the United States use is something called SCAT which is a shoreline cleanup assessment technique. And this literally involves people walking the beach periodically and, and noting whether you have no oiling, light oiling, medium or, or heavy. And so this is a map of uh, the maximum oiling along the Northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico based on these assessments. And that's really important because it gives you some situational awareness about where you need to deploy your resources, particularly into the heavily oiled beaches. Uh, and, and, so, and so that's uh, an important tool. And over time, you can basically use this as a metric of how well you're doing. You know, if you convert a heavily oiled uh, beach to a lightly oiled one because you have this comprehensive assessment, it becomes a very good tool uh, for the tactical parts of oil spill um, response. One of the other things that uh, was done in this region, which was a very much an ad hoc response measure, was to open... Uh, water diversions to the Mississippi River, which is the largest river in North America, and it creates an uh, enormous amount of fresh water that goes into the ocean. So um, the, the river diversions were, were originally set up to try to vent the sediment out into the marshes. And so somebody got the bright idea that if we just pushed enough fresh water out there, it would keep the oil from coming into the um, into the uh, estuaries that are, you know, uh, certainly highly sensitive areas. And so um, these are two what we call diversion structures, one called Davis Pond, which is on the southern side of the Mississippi River, and one called Car Carnivon on the northern side. These were pre-existing. And so you can see the, the, the mean discharge rates uh, based on normal discharge rates and, and what was pushed out of there. And so the question was, was that at, at all successful? And the answer was no. And so, the, and so you can see this, um, if you look very carefully at the SCAT assessment data, you can see that the heavily oiled beaches and, and wetlands were right, you know, inside these 
bays where the, the fresh water was being dumped. And what you see is a synthetic uh, aperture radar image on June the 4th, um, basically the radar can actually see oil sheen. And so you just see the oil sheen coming from the ocean into the, into the area. So one of the lessons that we've learned from many of these oil spills is that just because it sounds like a good idea um, and you, know, you have the capacity to do it, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea, right? So we, we wasted a lot of time and effort and money and really didn't do anything useful as far, in my estimation. Another one is sand berms. This is a, an, a place, it's a barrier uh, beach called Dolphin Island. And you can see the, it's a beautiful white sand beach, right? So uh, one of the thoughts was, you know, let's protect all that beautiful white sand by creating a dike um, from the sand. Now, the people on Dolphin Island are very protective of their, their sugar white beach, right? So they passed a regulation saying that no sand could come from other places that it would be used in creating sand burn. So if you see the, the Im lower image there, they, dig, they dug pits in the back of the barrier island to basically mine the sand to put on the front beach. Um, the, these dikes didn't last very long and they weren't very effective, but what they did was they left a legacy of increasing uh, or decreasing resilience of these beaches to severe storm events because those pits have never been filled in after the, after the sand burn. So this wasn't a very good idea either, right? Exxon Valdez, one of the, uh, one of the important um, things that people did, and you can see workers on the beach there trying to clean up. I mean, this is not a sand beach. This is a cobble beach. And so people got the bright idea to um, basically spray um, high pressure hoses, uh, in some cases, hot water, um, to basically um, flush the oil back into the water where it could be boomed and cleaned. The problem with this is that it actually modified the beaches. It got rid of a lot of the fine sediments and, the, um, and had a dramatic impact on the, the, the biota that live in the fine sediments, right? It also drove the oil deeper into the, into the, um, the, the, the substrate to the point where in some cases it, it drove it down to the anoxic line. And once oil uh, gets in the anoxic layer, it won't uh, for the weather. And so, as Frank said, we've been dealing with um, Exxon Valdez oil coming back primarily because, well, it, it certainly to a certain extent due to the, um, the oil spill um, uh, response issues. And so in Israel, don't do this. This is, was not a good idea. Um, so there are a lot of overarching questions that society has about oil spill impacts. Um, where is or was the oil? Is the seafood safe to eat? Is it safe to swim and use other natural resources? How fast will the oil go away? What marine resources will be affected and for how long? This is a critical one. Um, how will coastal communities be affected in short and long term? And are we better prepared for the next oil spill, which will occur, and I guarantee it. Uh, and, and those are all very active questions. These are agnostic to oil spills. Everybody wants to know these kinds of the answers to these questions. And so we've had a long-term research program specifically on deep water to look at some of these things. Um, th there are complex interactions between oil spills, ecosystems, and society. And I put this graphic up here, not because I'm going to talk about every little arrow to, to whatnot, but you can see that the oil spill itself uh, sets off a cascade of effects that include the, uh, that are affected by the ocean environment, that impact biological systems, that in, impact the ecosystem services that we generate from oil spills, including seafood consumption and, and you know, uh, coastal development. And they also influence the socioeconomic health of populations and their human, the, and human health. And it's direct human health impacts and indirect health, human health, particularly through the mental health issues. So very complex set of issues. So in, it, I know that um, our sponsor is, is interested in wildlife, so I wanted to sort of end my talk and, and um, talk a little bit more about impacts on wildlife. Um, obviously, when we look at various wildlife and it occurs everything from uh, microbes to mammals, um, it, uh, we not want to know about changes in resource abundance and demographics. Uh, we want to know about recovery times, that is recovery from what to what over what time frame. And these are all driven by um, 
both the degree of injury and the underlying dynamics of the of the populations, um, the pertinence of the concept of baselines. That is, we're trying to re restore something back to some time or some consequence. Well, you know, one of the things we know in ecology is um, our baselines continue to shift because of all sorts of other issues. And so trying to, you know, basically return to a baseline that may or may not exist is an important issue. Um, obviously, contaminant concentrations before, after, um, you know, are there controls or other areas that we can look at to understand what a uh, pristine population is? Uh, these so-called sublethal effects, um, they impact the individuals, the populations, and the communities. Uh, one of the things that was very apparent after Exxon was um, that we actually modified the underlying habitat itself. So it wasn't just the, um, the biological resources we were in, interested in. Um, their habitats were modified, which modifies the productivity of them. And so the question is, are those temporary habitat modifications or permanent? Um, and then as, I, as I've emphasized, the uh, impacts of count, as oil spill countermeasures need to be taken into account. Uh, account. Uh, and then as we're uh, contemplating active restoration activities, uh, what are the, what is the effectiveness of them? We can spend a lot of money doing things. Um, and what are the consequences of those act restoration activities? And one of the things that we've always found with big oil spills is, is the concept of black swans. Things we didn't know, we didn't know. And, and, and certainly um, uh, all of the large spills have shown us that you know nature works in mysterious ways. Right? So just just to highlight some of the the cascading set of effects, and particularly emphasizing um, sublethal effects, it, it all starts with exposure, which is in inhalation in the case of air breathing things, ingestion and absorption. Um, the action mechanisms in wildlife can be gen genomic. Um, they can you know result in cell damage and uh, oxidative stress in the animals. The clinical indicators are um, just the things that we would talk about in terms of people. Um, certainly um, in wildlife, we look, have to look at reproductive dysfunction, immune systems, a whole variety of organ system functions depending on you know, the, the, the sophistication of the, of the systems in the, in the animals. Uh, and these lead to long-term consequences for organisms. Um, certainly infections, abnormal behavior, eventually mortality, uh, growth inhibition, reproductive failure, uh, 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 body weights, and, and this has been effects that we've seen in a whole variety of animals, including dolphins, birds, etc. I just, just to show you some symptomology, this is a, a very iconic um, species in the Gulf of Mexico called red snapper. Um, one of the things that we were monitoring is the, the appearance of skin lesions. And we related it to the concentrations of, of various um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the animals. And you can see a very strong correlation between PAHs in the animals and the percent frequency of skin lesions. And so these health effects certainly can come out um, citizens reported that, that this phenomenon to us, uh, and so this um, talks about to the importance of citizen science, uh, which is, is quite important to us. Also, we can, we can actually expand our baselines. In this case, um, the group I work with was able to sample fishes all around the Gulf of Mexico, which is a semi-enclosed sea like the Mediterranean. And so we could actually look for hot spots. And of course the big hot spot was in the area where Deepwater Horizon was. So that gives us confidence that, that it, we were looking at that effect. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about on the ecological side is um, how do we actually um, extrapolate to those resources we think are most vulnerable to a particular skill and, more, uh, and their degree of resilience to that spill. And so we, we came up with a number of attributes. So on the vulnerability, it, it relates to the spatial overlap of the spill with populations and a whole variety of things. And on the resilience, uh, it relates to the lifespan of the animal, the age at which it first reproduces, et cetera. So we can, we can actually, um, we can plot things in terms of their vulnerability and their resilience to oil spills. And that's actually what this does for a number of communities in the Gulf. So you've got 
uh, for example, in the in the top left, you've got um, animals in the in the uh, coastal and estuarine area of low, medium, and high vulnerability to deep water horizon, and low, medium, and high resilience. So, the problem with um, it, it are the things in red, where you've got things like dolphins, which are highly vulnerable and not particularly resilient. So you can actually uh, array the species you're dealing with on these kinds of metrics. Um, I'll skip over some of this. Last point I wanna make, and I, um, at my time limit, um, there are a number of things to consider in terms of um, lessons learned. Um, obviously clean up uh, worker health and safety is a primary concern. And as Frank said, uh, PPE and uh, volatile organic uh, components, uh, the monitoring is imperative. Um, the public wants to be assured of the safety of the seafood supply. Um, some response measures um, can be more damaging than others. Uh, Pre-spill baselines are very critical for attribution. That is, are the effects we see in due to the spill, but they're rarely available at proper scales. Um, you know, this is expensive to collect these data. And even in our own country, um, we are constantly crying for baselines uh, you know, we, we really don't know the condition of those resources in, in terms of its uh, chemical burden the day before the spill. Post-spill uh, monitoring is important. In the case of Exxon and Deepwater, uh, we got very large um, long-term resources from the responsible party to do a variety of, uh, of health monitoring, which has been very helpful. And obviously recovery takes a long time. So with that, um, I would say, uh, just note that there's a lot of resources in the United States, um, agency resources, academic resources, and others, and we all would be happy to um, put you in touch with those resources. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moraski. Only one comment. Uh, you talked about the length of the recover of the area. We know in the desert of Israel, we have an oil spill about uh, six years ago. Uh, while uh, trying to, to deal with it, we found another oil spill that occurred in 1975, 40 years ago. And it still in, uh, consists, not, not, uh, no cure was taken. So everything is damaged and not recure. The oil spill of uh, uh, 2015 we took some materials to to take over the, the particles. And uh, now we know that about 46% were removed, but uh, until now, at least 50% uh, remained. So the acacia trees, which are very important to the ecological system there, still cannot grow there. So what you talked about, the length of the occasion, it will be very long, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Our last speaker in this session is Dr. Loren Alexander Augustine. Like me, she started her career as an engineer, but since then she went on to earn her doctorate at Harvard University in a program that combined physical hydrology, geomorph geomorphology, and ecology. She has worked in a variety of wide variety of uh, roles on a broad range of topics uh, pertaining to water, natural disasters, and resilience. Dr. Agustin is currently the executive director for the Gulf Research Program of the National Acad Academics of, the Sci of Science, Sciences, which was formed as a part of illegal settlements from the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, Dr. Alexander Agustin. Thank you so much. Um, is my screen? Showing? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you and yes. yes. screen. Okay, um, then I, I'll, I'll just continue. Let me start by saying thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for um, inviting this perspective into this important discussion. And it's been a real honor to work with uh, the museum and my American counterparts in preparing this talk. So my title of my talk is, When is an oil spill just an oil spill? And the answer is never. It's never just an oil spill. And this talk, I'll, I'll really talk about, you know, why. And it's because things are very complex. There's a lot of complexities when oil 
is on top of the water or in the water column. And so I'll talk about this in terms of the complexities of, of getting oil, um, particularly over or from underneath water, the environment. And we heard from Dr. Morawski and we heard from Frank Von Tipple and Van Von Tipple and what, we'll talk about the, a little bit about the complexities of oil and the environment. And then this overlay of people, right? This is the other piece. And these happen to be the three parts of the program that I run at the Gulf Research Program, um, oil, environment, and people, how these things come together. And then I'll end this, this talk with, well, where do we go from here? Um, now that we know this, where do we go from here? So with that, let me start. You will see this particular um, Venn diagram a few times because this is this overlap that I will continue to talk about. I'll start with the complexities of oil because oil is complex in and of itself. Scope and scale. How much oil are we trying to, to, to produce? Where? How, how much? Where's it from? Is this under? Is this offshore? Is this onshore? Deep? Shallow? Where is it coming from? Dynamics. Oil is liquid. It's in water, which is liquid. There's a lot of things that are moving. How do we understand the dynamics of the fluid dynamics at play? What type of oil is it? Dr. Morawski talked a lot about different kinds of crude, different kinds of this. Types of oil matters. Risk and expense. Dr. Morawski also, it's nice to go last, right? Because they said all, all of the important details, but the risk, the, the expense here is non-trivial. When you're talking about something in the billions, nothing is simple. So how much does it cost? And more importantly, who pays? Timeline, how long will the oil spill? We heard one, we heard about one spill that went for nine months. Deepwater Horizon that we work on went for 87 days. How long does it spill? I'll talk about another oil spill, the Taylor oil spill that started in 2004 and is still spilling. So how long does it last? How long will the oil come? And then finally, not just how long will the oil spill, but how long will the effects last? So these are the complexities around just the oil part of it. Now on, on the Israeli shore, this should look a little bit familiar to this audience. Um, you guys have some stuff out in the offshore, mostly gas, but, um, and, and, and it's a small in terms of scope. Important, but small in terms of scope. When we talk about oil in the offshore, this is just the, off of uh, Texas and Louisiana, Alabama, and a little bit of Mississippi. We have thousands of rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, about 2,000 rigs, but for every rig, there's multiple wells. So this is a big operation in the scope in the United States of offshore drilling and, and the potential for oil spills is really high. You'll note on this, on this map, there's a red line that I added and it's right about the place where the state of Florida comes in. And you might be wondering why that is and why is there no drilling east of that line? And I just wanna say that the scope and where oil is sourced has something to do with national security. In this case, Pensacola has a national, um, a Navy air station. So a lot of airplanes, a big, huge Navy base, no drilling off of Florida. So there's, this is the scope of what we're dealing with, national security to the east and a very rich uh, oil field um, in the Gulf. Big business, this is a lot of money. So on the scale in the Gulf of Mexico, we're talking about one and a half million barrels of crude a day, every day in the Gulf of Mexico. When I say big business, BP in the quarter right before the spill, so the spill happened in April and first quarter of 2010, Deep, or BP made $5.6 billion in profit, one quarter. They paid $25 billion to the United States government in, for their exactions of, of the laws around um, the spill. Like Steve said, upwards of maybe $60 billion total. And here's the thing, they stayed in business. BP is still in business. This is how big this business is. And so there's a lot that can be moved when you're talking about money at this scale. So I'm gonna try a little technical thing here. I have a clip, I'm gonna see if I can um, get the clip up. So hang on one second while I switch the screens. Okay, 
you guys see that? I'm going to start this clip. This is a this is a, a, a very brief one minute clip about how complex offshore drilling is. On the evening of the 20th of April 2010, I got a call from the Coast Guard Command Center advising me there had been an explosion on a rig off the coast of Louisiana. The spill of record in this country was, of course, the Exxon Valdez. When the Deepwater Horizon explosion occurred in 2010, we were actually going to war with the tools we had created in the previous 20 years to prevent a tanker accident. This is closer to Apollo 13 than it was the Exxon Valdez. It's the worst offshore oil spill in our country's history. No matter how much you put on scene in terms of fire boom, dispersants, the oil replenished itself every day. No one had ever known how to deal with a mile deep explosion like this. We had to bring together all of the expertise we could on how could we stop the spill without making it worse. The first thing we started doing was drilling relief wells. The relief well had to be drilled adjacent to the well that was there and then penetrate the well at the reservoir and actually put cement in there and recreate the rock that had enclosed the reservoir. It was an extraordinarily difficult process. Relief wells were going to take months. So while we started that right away, we kept thinking there has to be a quicker solution as well. We got very lucky by a on-the-fly decision to construct what's called a capping stack that was ready by early July. We put this capping stack on top of the outer control well at the bottom of the ocean, enough pressure had been relieved that that capping stack was likely to hold, and it did. In July, we capped the well. We did not finish the relief well until September, and that's when I declared there was no threat of discharge. Okay, so can you, is my screen back? That, that's how complicated, um, there's lots of ways that oil can get into the water. That is a very complicated way, but there's natural seeps like, like Steve talked about, offshore drilling and production, transportation that Frank talked about in terms of the Exxon Valdez and other accidents and intentional acts. There's a reason we don't drill off of Florida because we don't want intentional acts there, right? So when we talk about sources of oil, I, I said I would talk about a spill that's been going on since 2004. This is the Taylor Energy incident. So we know about this in 2004 when a hurricane, Hurricane Ivan came in and underneath the Gulf of Mexico, it created um, a mudslide. And that mudslide effectively kind of scraped the top off of a, of a well that had been sealed. And the oil started to come up. We think it was around 2004. No one found the oil until 2010 when they were looking for oil from Deepwater Horizon. And now, and it still is going on. It was capped in 2018, but this is what we're talking about in terms of the complexities of the sources of oil. If this continues, the Taylor spill may be the biggest oil spill in United States history. It's one of the longest, for sure. Oops, that went backwards. Where am I going? Okay. Um, once oil hits the water, and Steve touched on this and Frank did too, it starts to move and we get a slick and the slick moves. At one estimate of the Deepwater Horizon slick was over 68,000 square miles. And you can see it has this little loop that comes down, it's complicated, and all of this has to go somewhere. You clean it up, it has to attenuate, it has to go somewhere. So the movement of the oil is also complex. Also, whose problem is it, right? I mean, we have international companies, we have international ships. This occurs in international waters for an international market. So whose oil, whose problem, who pays? These are big questions. So those are some of the complexities around oil all by itself. You start to bring in the environment and things get really, they get kind of personal, like Frank was talking about. It feels personal, right? Because what's affected? Well, the marine environment's affected, the coastal environment, the terrestrial environment, and their ecosystems. So all of those organisms that live in those environments can be affected. You start to burn oil, and now you have a, an air environment as well. All of this is in a highly dynamic in, um, circumstance. And in most cases, it's a horrible combination. So marine, coastal, I also want to talk about the people and the people's economies because these are also affected. And so let me go to my second video that talks a little bit about 
this. This is very short, so hang on one second. One second. The toll of the disaster on the community was really tremendous. Most everyone in there lives off of the environment, lives off of the water, shrimp, oysters, fishing, sportsmen. All of these things are linked to the coast and there's a dramatic impact. It's very difficult to answer what the exact environment impact was. There's a lot of things that linger in the environment that can last for many years and impact survival and reproduction and the health of the environment for a long time to come. And that is more difficult to assess. It's going to take a long time to really understand the long-term impacts. The wetlands in southern Louisiana and the barrier islands and the coast of Mississippi, in my view, are going to be feeling this for a long, long time. Um, so you hear here that we're talking about Fat Allen, right? He's the, he was the National Incident Commander. He says, a long time. Francis Weiss says, we really don't know. Steve Murawski said the same thing. Frank said the same thing. So as these effects of, in the wildlife, we just don't know. But what we do know is that there is a link to the people. We know that it's up to people to clean up oil in the environment. Steve talked about uh, personal protective equipment. Look what happens when people just go on the, on the beach to clean up. There's all kinds of, of health risks. We need um, personal protective equipment, we need boom, all these things go into the cleanup, right? Um, and then of course the heartbreaking piece about saving the, the really charismatic me megafauna. So when we get to this, when we get to these three things together, we're talking about people, we're talking about the oil workers, impacted communities, first responders, like Frank was talking about, ecotoxicology, short-term effects, long-term effects, fisheries, tourism, human health. I just want to have one note about fisheries. In Louisiana, fisheries is a $2.5 million a year industry. So when oil comes in and it affects it, then it affects the fisheries. Can you eat the seafood? Can you eat the fish? Can you eat the shrimp? These are important, not just health considerations, but also economic ones. This is the environment in which we work. So that's the complexities. And so the big question now is what can we do? Where do we go from here? How do we move forward? And the answer may lie in the areas of nexus in terms of what we learn, what we study, and where we make investments. So if we think about the nexus between oil and the environment, like what are we going to learn? What do we need to understand more? We really need to understand the ecotoxicology. How long does oil and its particles stay in the system? What effect does it have on marine life? What effect does it have on coastal life? What effect does it have on people? When it comes to restoration, everyone says, yeah, oh, we see it, it was befouled and we, we want it to go back. But do we want it to go back to the way it was? Do we want it to go back to something better? How do we know what it was, like Steve said, when there's no baseline data? And then there's conservation. You know, we want to conserve, we want to protect, but what are we protecting? And can we get back to that? So there's some really big questions around the environmental protection piece when oil meets the environment. That's, that's one piece. Second piece is where the, is the nexus between oil and people. And this is the piece that probably drives all of it because this is a big industry. Because culture needs, every society needs energy sources, right? So we have an industry piece, but then we have a worker safety piece, right? It's not just on the rigs, it's the workers all across the system. It's the people who have to come in and maybe clean up as well. So there's a worker safety. In the United States, and I know in Israel too, there's a big regulator piece. You know, who's overseeing this? How do we know that there's gonna be safety for people who work around oil? Health equity. In the United States, we have an enormous problem with equity 
where black people, brown people, and those who do not speak English as a first language are the most likely to have the most dangerous jobs or the most likely to be closest to the most hazardous parts of this business. So we have a health equity issue in the United States. First responders, the communities that rely on, on this industry, there's a community health piece, there's community resilience piece, there's a livelihood piece, there's an economics piece, there's all kinds of pieces when it comes to how people must work with oil. And then finally, the environment and the people. And this is kind of the, this is kind of a, the, a theme, right? We have environmental health, we have the economy, we have community resilience, and we have environmental justice. That goes back to the health equity as well. But here in the middle, where everything overlaps, this is where at least my program is really digging in. And this is where we have big questions around what science is needed. Because if we can address the issues that touch all three circles, we might be able to have an amplified beneficial impact on all of the circles. So we have a piece about science. What do we need to learn? What do we need to study? We have a piece about information. Who needs information? What kind of information do they need? When do they need it? In what format do they need it? What are they going to do with it, right? Then there's pieces about policy and strategy. So the policies, you know, how do we set the rules for engagement moving forward? And how do we get a strategy so that we don't do what Steve said, which is fight the last oil spill and instead prepare for the next one because there will be a next one, okay? So this is the last part of my talk and, and let's just finish this up. So science and information right, as it informs policy and strategy, here's what we're trying to do. And not just the Gulf Research Program, not just the United States. This is universal. Everybody's trying to do this with oil. We're trying to better understand. So we want to assess the risk and we want to reduce the risk of oil in the offshore. This is a universal goal. Everyone is aiming for this, going about it differently, but aiming for this one goal. The other thing is we want to manage our assets. You know, we talk about this being big business. We talk about the economies that are right on the coast that can be affected. So the assets we have are ecological, they're economic, they're energy, but they're also human, right? They're human and environmental assets as well. The third thing that we all share as end goals is how do we mitigate the impact? If this happens again, when this happens again, how do we get in front of what we think is going to happen so that the impacts are less than they have been in the past? And then finally, we all want to build resilience to oil disasters. And so on the science side, on the GRP and, 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 and um, Steve and Murawski and the uh, Gulf of Mexico research uh, initiative, Palmer, what do we still need to know? Who can help us learn what we need to know? And how can we apply what we learn? These are the science questions that at least the GRP is really trying to tackle. And then this other piece about information. Right form, right time, who needs it, who provides it, how do you know it's trustworthy, how do you, how do you validate? These are, the, these are the pieces that we're working on. <coughs> so in the GRP, we're looking at this center space, right? And we're looking at reducing systemic Looking at things like how does the how do the currents of the Gulf of Mexico affect offshore for hurricanes, for currents, for movement of oil, for the delivery of oil to the shore, those kinds of things. There's a there's a whole physical dynamic piece of the Gulf of Mexico that we're studying um, with a lot with uh, with great intention. Um, how do we ensure people who need information can get it? And this gets to a really big effort we have around convening and collaboration and exchange, and you'll hear those words again, but we're, we're really trying to make sure that those like Steve Murawski and Frank Von Hippel, who are developing models who can say, I know what happens to the whales, I know what happens to the dolphins, and we can get that information into the hands of those who can take action. That's that third bullet. <coughs> These last ones are about building strong coalitions. If you really look, particularly at Deepwater Horizon, because there were so much money 
that came in the settlements, billions of dollars. My program got a half a billion. The one that Steve worked on also had a half a billion. And there's 22 billion other dollars out there, right? So how do we get, how do we corral all of that intellectual capital to build stronger coalitions around offshore safety and environmental protection and healthy and resilient communities that support the offshore and the oil industry? And then finally, how, how do we make sure that the people remain healthy and resilient? So that's what we're working on in GRP. Like I said, these are pretty universal questions going along. So some of the policy needs. When we work with the United States government and the state agencies, people want to know how do you prepare for the next oil disaster? And it's the next one. I mean, we're not going to have Deepwater Horizon again. We're not going to have the Exxon Valdez again. We're going to have something else. So how do we get our heads straight for what's ahead of us, given all kinds of dynamic things going on in the world around us. How do we ensure that when we identify oil in the sea, that we can get to the source and that we can secure that source? It took 87 days to stop the spill in the Deepwater Horizon. It took nine months in the one Steve talked about. Taylor spill took years once we figured out that it was actually leaking again. So how do we ensure that? How do we get on top of that? What kind of models are we needing? What kind of instrumentation do we need to know, right? Um, and then the other pieces are about after the oil's there. How do you clean it up? How, how clean is clean? How do you know it's done well, completely, responsibly, right? And then how do we ensure that the responsible parties take responsibility? Now in the United States, we're pretty litigious. We're gonna find people who, uh, who spilled the oil and, and we usually hold them accountable, but sometimes you can't do that. Taylor is out of business. We can't sue the Taylor energy because there's no one there. What do you do? Who pays in those cases? Here are the policy needs. I just want to let you know that in the United States, there's a whole constellation of federal agencies, 15 agencies that have some role in oil pollution and oil pollution research. It's called ICOPAR. But these 15 agencies work together and the GRP work with them too. And Steve mentioned that there are resources. This is a resource, the GRP is a resource. I do hope that you will reach out to us. So when we think about this, the, the kinds of work that we do, and I do invite you into our work, I invite you with, with warm and open arms because we're looking to have greater coordination across stakeholders. Now we already said there is no American oil spill, just like there's no Israeli oil spill. They're the same companies, they're the same tankers, they're the same buyers, so we're all in this together and we need a strong coordination among the stakeholders. We also need to work together. So there's a big collaboration piece to this. And we also need to learn from each other. We need to exchange our information, we need to exchange our data. What did you learn? What did you do? What models did you use? What models worked better than the others? So we're really looking to build this community so that we all can move towards these end goals together. We want to reduce this risk. We want to manage our assets. We want to mitigate the impacts of disasters, and we want to build resilience to oil disasters. Um, here are some links for you for the GRP. We have, um, just to prove that it's not just talk, we have an upcoming event called the Offshore Situation Room, where we're gaming an, an oil spill. A serious game, right? It's a, it's a few hours of over a few days, and we all role play. You know, what do you do if you're a state agency? What do you do if you're a beach cleanup? What do you do if you're a community? What do you do if you're industry? And this is a piece of trying to understand where the other piece of people and, and other stakeholders are coming from. That's in June, that's this link. I'll be happy to share these slides. There's a webinar series on offshore safety. So if you don't wanna be part of the serious games, I do welcome you. We have a whole series of experts, just like this one, one hour webinars that talk about the different elements of offshore safety, including cleanup, regulation, and of course, um, the actual sourcing of, of oil spills. So there's a webinar series there. And then just generally, the, the Gulf Research Program has a, a lot of resources on its website as the third bullet. So with that, I will say thank you. I think I am right on time, just one minute uh, under the 30 minutes. And I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Agustin. It's very, very interesting. Thank you all, three speakers and marvelous speakers for a very fascinating session. We learned a lot. I think we, we learned that we can learn much more to the continuous of the symposium. It will teach us much more how to record the shows of Israel. And uh, back to you, the microphone back to you, Tamar. Thank you very much, Shaul, and thanks the speakers who will stay on with us to hear the Israeli speakers now uh, outline briefly the situation in Israel, and then we'll follow with the discussion. So uh, Dr. Yoshua Shkedi, Chief Scientist of the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, please step up. I will step up. Please let me open the camera. It's blocked. All right. And please open the camera also to uh, Professor uh, Yossi Leshem and to yeah. Rani Amir, uh, which I believe are going to be uh, the panel for the uh, next uh, uh, session. I was uh, told that I'm going to lead this session about one minute before uh, six. So I really prepared myself well, and I will introduce my colleagues uh, in a very uh, friendly Israeli manner. Uh, and uh, you see, I forgot to put my tie on and everything. Shkedi, so, uh, this is Yossi Loya, not the oscillation. Oy va voy. <laughs> you see, I was not prepared well. Uh, professor uh, Loya will be the first speaker. Uh, he is a professor in Tel Aviv University. He is a world known uh, figure in uh, uh, know how, how to uh, deal with uh, corals. Uh, he is expert on, on coral and coral reefs, especially in a lot and uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, worldwide, and uh, you'll see the floor is yours. Yossi is muted and his camera is off. Can someone open it? Yes, you are muted. No, he's not. No, I think I'm okay. But you... I'm sorry, this was not my turn, so I'm looking for my presentation, just for a minute. Do you want Rani Amir to start? And no, then no, 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 I'll, I'll do it, just a minute. If you all be patient, Okay, can you see this? Please put it on presentation mode. Yes, we can see that. Good. You can see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. So uh, about uh, sometime last year or even before, I gave a lecture of an uh, historical outlook on the coral reefs of Elat. And this was uh, 50 years of coral community structure studies. And today um, I'll concentrate on one part of it. I divided uh, these 50 years into a timeline of uh, the years prior to 1970, which I called them the golden years. And then 71 to 79, the oil pollution years. Uh, 1980, I have to move that. 1980 to 1995, the sewage years, 1995 to 2009, the devastating years of the fish cages with acute detrimental effects on the reef's health. 2010, 2020, signs of increasing reef recovery. And today or 2021, our bleak future to the coral reefs of Elat. I'll start, uh, as I said, I'll concentrate on the past 
and that is 71 to 79, and end my lecture with the future of the coral reefs of Elat and my experience during these times as to what happened to the reefs. So uh, the golden years, as you can see, 1970s or before 1970s, we have fantastic reefs, very high species diversity of corals. As a matter of fact, one of the highest in the world in shallow water, and we are talking on within habitat diversity, high complexity, very healthy reef, beautiful reefs, and as you can see all these colors, colors I can uh, talk more and more on how beautiful the reefs were then. Then came some sad years, and these are the 1971 to 1980. I call this uh, the oil pollution years, and these were years uh, after the Six Day War, where we received, uh, where oil tankers came mainly from Iran and from Egypt and unloaded their oil at the oil terminals in Elat. Here we can see the major places that I'll be talking about. This is the Coral Nature Reserve that you see it here, rounded by red, and two oil terminals that we will see later on what happened in this area. Here is an oil ter terminal in, uh, the photograph was taken in 1970. There are two of those in a lot. And what you can see here, and I'll talk about and, and show it over and over again, is the chronic oil spills that took place during this time at a lot. As a matter of fact, we are talking on two to three crude oil spills every month. The entire coral nature reserve was black, as you can see it in here. And uh, this repeated itself over and over. We call them chronic oil spills. And uh, I can tell you that at that time, there were no uh, studies on what does oil do to corals. As a matter of fact, in the literature, there were only one or two uh, publications uh, as to what uh, oil is doing to coral. And uh, if I'll summarize it in two sentences, what they said is the following. I visited a uh, oil terminal in Saudi Arabia. I have seen lush, beautiful coral growth. Conclusion, oil does not harm corals. However, when you look at the address of the uh, author, it is Shell Oil Company, Houston, Texas. So here you are supposed to laugh. That is what we knew at that particular time. And since we had the repeated oil spills all the time, we had to go and study this terrible black stuff as to what is it doing to corals. And this reminds me of a, a photo that I think Frank has showed uh, on how oil at that time was being cleaned up from the shores of a lot. Here you can see two volunteers. I think in the photo that Frank showed, there were uh, hundreds of volunteers spreading this hay. This was the high tech at that time to how to combat oil pollution. At that time, remember, there was no Office of, uh, of the Environment. There was no uh, uh, Shkedi on, online. There was no Charles Goldstein online. There was no whatsoever any idea how to deal with these things. And public awareness was really minimal. I was amazed to see or to hear from Shaul that during the recent Mediterranean uh, spill that we, <coughs> that we had along our beaches, there were 1,500 or 15,000 volunteers that, was, that were uh, occupied in cleaning the spill. And you see what happened in a lot during those days. There was almost no one. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that I was then a very young lecturer 
and uh, Shimon Perez was the minister of the environment, the minister of transportation at that time. And when we had some sort of a seminar, uh, I told him that uh, we uh, there is a danger that one of these tankers that visited the lab will blow, and the whole Gulf will be covered black. And his answer was, "Don't worry, young man." Uh, the Sixth Fleet is going to save us. So that was more or less the attitude, both of the government, uh, to what, uh, what we had uh, in a lot at those times. So as I said, we had to study, uh, and what I'm saying in the next two or three minutes is, is maybe years of studies and many papers to study what does oil pollution do to corals. And we, of course, studied what we called uh, a le the lab red Stylophora pistillata, which is the most abundant coral in the Gulf of Elat. It covers almost 20% in shallow water. So naturally that was the best coral to study. Uh, we also knew a lot about its biology. So we could study what does coral, what does oil, crude oil do to uh, stony corals and Stylophora as, as the coral that we studied. So uh, we divided our studies to both field studies and laboratory study studies. In the field studies, we compared polluted reefs versus clean reefs. And uh, in, in one sentence, the results showed very clearly that there was higher mortality of corals in areas that are affected by oil spills and remember again, these oil spills came over and over and over again. And uh, if we counted the number of planuli larvae that were shed by the corals, and you can see them here, we collect them with plankton nets, we can count the number of planuli. So clearly there were fewer planuli shed per coral head than in uh, clean areas. And also there was very low or absence of recruitment in areas that were affected by oil. In the lab studies, again, just uh, this is a uh, one sentence of a result, which, which stands for a whole paper. We've shown in histological studies, a decrease in the number of ovaries per polyp that is in the sexual organs of the corals. And here I can appreciate Frank's uh, statement on reproductive failure that he mentioned in other organisms, except that we are usually worrying about large organisms or uh, we're talking about uh, sea turtles, uh, marine mammals, fish, birds, turtles, and so on. And we are not aware as to what is going on in the seafloor in deeper water, what happens to the bentos, to Professor, a whole Professor suit Lawyer, of... Or... Professor Loya, two minutes, please. Thank you so much. You, you told me that I have another three minutes, so I'll jump up. All right. We have <laughs> lower reproduction of colonies in reproduction and a lower life expectancy of planuli in increasing concentrations of crude oil. Uh, but perhaps the most dramatic thing to describe is what we call what we call an abortion effect. That is premature planuli shedding. If you take a small petri dish with seawater and put a small branch of stylophora during reproduction in that petri dish, and you put in another one drop of oil, you can see how the calyx of the uh, coral opens up, and a immature or a planula is aborted, and then very uh, shortly after that dies. So uh, just to finish up with the bleak future of the uh, Eilat coral reefs, I'd like to take this opportunity and warn, or, uh, um, warn you all as to what we may see in the very near future in Eilat. And this is a photo uh, in January 2021 of a super tanker uh, coming from the Persian Gulf, unloading its crude oil. And uh, as a matter of fact, a recent initiative uh, is to transport oil from the Persian Gulf states to a lot. 
And from there to the Mediterranean ports and onward to Europe, the, using the old infrastructure of the Katza Elat Ashkelon pipeline. And uh, as uh, Noga told me a few days ago, since January 2021, or since January, there were nine super tankers like that, which unloaded the oil at, at, at uh, Elat uh, oil terminals. So uh, here I must tell you that uh, the plan is that every year, dozens of huge tankers, something like 20, 250,000 tons, will unload their contents of crude oil at Eilat's oil terminals. And as you know, these terminals border the coral nature reserve of Eilat. So the entire Gulf and the Sinai coast, as well as the Mediterranean coast and the land in between will, will be exposed to an enormous danger from leaks, accidents, or terror events. Uh, somebody made the account that a spill of only 1% of the contents of such a huge super tanker to the sea amounts to thousands of barrels of oil that would spread through the entire Gulf, through the entire Gulf. Um, here I would like to emphasize that unlike the recent event in the Mediterranean, that fortunately so far is the only event that we experienced, in a lot during the 70s, there were repeated chronic oil spills every month for several years. It is a shame that uh, Minister uh, Gal Gila Gamliel is not with us in this webinar, but uh, Noga is here, Shaul is here, Shkedi, and all of you who are present, please show your concern in any way you can. This is not an early warning call. This is in fact the 19th minute call a lot's precious coral reefs and unique reefs are in real danger. We have to do everything we can to alert decision makers to this grave situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Loya. Uh, I will give the floor to Rani Amir. Uh, he is from the Ministry of Environment and is the focal point of uh, all the cleanup and all the event uh, because he is the head of the Department of Seas and Coast. I believe this is the right translation uh, to your uh, position. Uh, Rani, the floor is yours. Please, 10 minutes. Thank you, Shkadi, very much. The official uh, position is the Marine Environment Protection Division in the Ministry of Environmental Protection. And uh, yes, you are right. I am uh, I'm the uh, focal point. I'm the um, uh, event manager in this case that we had the tar uh, pollution. Uh, can I share a screen also? Sure. It's possible, right? Okay. So I think... Um, I think it will be better if uh, I will use this uh, stage to uh, quickly go through what we had, uh, what we had, uh, um, what we had uh, along the coastline in Israel for the last uh, 30 days or so. Uh, we call the this event uh, "Tar in the Storm" is Efet Basara in Hebrew for our American uh, colleagues. It's uh, "Tar in the Storm." Um, it began. Um, uh, exactly uh, on the 17th of February, 30 days ago, uh, where we uh, where we uh, learned in the morning, it was Wednesday morning, that we are uh, covered by TARS beginning from uh, the south and going to the north of the country. What you see here is a model, uh, the Metzlik oil spill model that we are running whenever there is a a spill or a chance for a spill. So you can see uh, that uh, uh, the spill, the, the model is uh, is um, a trajectory which uh, anticipates the spill and uh, its uh, fate. 
you can see that uh, the model is quite accurate, run by, of course, I didn't mention, but the IRLR, the uh, Israeli Limnological and Oceanographic Institute, which who is uh, who are working with us uh, closely on this uh, on on the matter of um, hydrography. So you can uh, learn from the model that uh, the spill was traveling uh, in the sea uh, around uh, 17 days. We, uh, we uh, speculated and then afterwards we managed to uh, locate the exact source of the spill, which was a tanker by the name of Emerald, uh, which spilled uh, its uh, content or some of, the, some of its uh, content. Uh, between the 1st and the 2nd of January of February, which means it was traveling around 16 days or two weeks. Now, the fate when the tar arrived uh, on shore, it was, uh, it was a quite a shocking uh, um, sight, we can say that, uh, because uh, the, uh, the tar was spread uh, almost along all Israeli shoreline. Um, and I can say that uh, uh, the magnitude and the spread was uh, was uh, was significant. It was uh, it was uh, I think it was the first or the worst one that we have seen for the last maybe 30 years in the Mediterranean Israeli coastline. Um, having said that, uh, I must uh, lower down or maybe downgrade the uh, extreme. The extreme, uh, um, maybe, uh, um, uh, window that appears from here that because it still is a tar. It's uh, the residuals of uh, crude oil, which were under, uh, under severe uh, sea conditions uh, with everything that it means, which means that when it arrived at the shoreline, we are dealing with tar, which is a semi-solid situation of the, of the crude oil. And uh, it has two, let's say, two basic, two basic uh, uh, perceptions. One, it's uh, relatively easy to remove, relatively easy to remove, because when you pick it up, you can put it inside a bag and you can manually uh, take it off the most of the shoreline. And when I'm saying most of the shoreline, I'm referring to not those that you see in the picture, where the tar is a sticky uh, crude oil, which sticks to the rocky shoreline. And this is quite hard to remove, but most of the Israeli coastline is not like that. So uh, relatively speaking, the tar is easily manually removed. On the other hand, uh, tar, as I said, uh, tar is uh, sticky. And when it goes inside the rocky shore, uh, it goes into the, into the uh, pores uh, and you can see that uh, on the right picture, when it sticks to the to the uh, holes in the in the in the in the rocky shore, it's quite uh, uh, it's quite hard to remove. So, all in all, we are lucky, and that I can say now that we didn't face crude oil in the, its uh, full liquid form. Otherwise, it would have been uh, quite a disaster, and this wasn't the case. Uh, I want to put some numbers uh, and figures because uh, uh, whoever listened to the media for the last 30 days, I, I would guess that uh, the picture was uh, not exactly fully understood. So we estimate the, the, uh, initial, the initial quantity that came out of this tanker, uh, something around tens, maybe few hundreds of tons, not more because there were numbers saying thousands and 2000. No, we think it's, well, it, were, it was not more than a few uh, tens or hundreds of tons of crude oil of some kind or some kind of crude oil uh, or crude oil residuals, uh, which uh, came to the shore and after spreading and after picking up more than 85% of the, of the waste, the tar waste, uh, we can say that we are in the stage of around um, 900, maybe 1,000 tons of oily waste, which is the after after the tar had gained also um, waste uh, when it came to the shore. So here you can see uh, pictures from <clears throat> from the shores of Achziv, which is a natural reserve, as uh, as you know, 
Well, it uh, is, please. Yes. Uh, now, a uh, few animals were uh, were hurt, were uh, were polluted. Here you can see sea turtles. Uh, the Natural Parks uh, Authority had observed some ten, and we know there were some more afterwards. Uh, but uh, as uh, I think one of the professors said in the beginning, uh, it's what you don't see uh, uh, what hurts the more the most. Uh, the uh, microscopic, the microscopic uh, life in the in the ocean are the most vulnerable ones, uh, and uh, and these are uh, this is the first the first uh, f the first grade of the food chain which hurts the more uh, the most. So uh, the tar was spread. Here you can see some uh, uh, some uh, shores which are affected. It's in the north. It's Betset, Betset Beach. Uh, some tars uh, also uh, were were sunk in the lower uh, lower water, in the lower tide uh, uh, zone of the of the of the shoreline, and it is uh, beaching some uh, every every once in a while. Uh, so uh, it still comes up in several places, especially in the northern part of the, uh, the country. Here you can see some efforts that we made to try and absorb uh, oil when it comes to the shoreline. It wasn't very successful because of the tar and its physical uh, condition. Uh, here you can see some pictures, uh, which is uh, misleading. You can see here, this is not, not tar. The tar is located on the front end of the, of the beach. These are weeds and uh, seagrass. So uh, we've seen many pictures like that, which were uh, misleading. Basically, this wasn't uh, the case. Uh, uh, I think one of the our colleagues uh, said something about um, uh, measuring the beach, measuring the coastline, measuring the uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the let's say the amount of pollution. We have uh, we have uh, we've we have managed to do some uh, innovative thing. We call it uh, we call it the uh, the pollution light. Uh, uh, lights or Ramzo, uh, we, we managed to measure every once in a while the amount of pollution on the shoreline, giving it a grade of one to five. Red, of course, is the most polluted, heavy polluted, polluted uh, shoreline, and green is one that you cannot see any uh, tar in it anymore. So uh, we followed that uh, closely along the, the event. Uh, and uh, by the way, today we managed to uh, to call the end of the event. Uh, and let me say that uh, closing an event of such a scale is uh, not easy uh, because we have seen uh, and we've heard today also the term of how clean is clean and when do, when do you get to declare a coastline uh, which is clean. Uh, so we took, uh, we took responsibility and this is the situation today. Rani, and, please, uh, thank you, Shkedi. Rani, please finish. One minute, just. Uh, I just did. Thank you. you. Just did. Thank you so much. Uh, my good friends from the, this session left me three minutes, so um, I'm not going to present anything, but I'm going to refer uh, to what uh, our uh, distinguished guest from uh, America just said, and I think we we learned a lot. Uh, uh, Professor Augustine was referring to to scale. Well, the scale was large because we're talking about 160 something kilometers, but the scale of magnitude was not that big. Rani Amir just uh, told us that, and the wave just jumped the, uh, the tar a bit away from the intertidal, so uh, the biological damage was not that high. Uh, I'm an ecologist, I'm working for the uh, Israel Nature and Park Authority, and I'm talk going to talk mainly on ecology, not to any other effect. Um, so uh, uh, it is the, the, the name Exxon Valdez was uh, and, uh, mentioned so many times in, in, in the lectures today. This is not the, the Exxon Valdez, not even close to that, but it is pointing out that I have to admit that we are not well prepared for the next event, for the big one. Uh, because uh, we were lucky enough, as uh, Rani said, that uh, this was not uh, the, the big one, the big uh, pollution, but I don't think that we are uh, uh, well prepared 
uh, uh, for that. So we have to uh, work a lot in order not to be uh, surprised the next time, because next time we, we cannot say anything. It is not a surprise. So we have to uh, do things properly. Um, if, if, if Professor von Hippo said that uh, it is political, personal, but I'm going to refer to the ecological. It is visual, uh, something that uh, 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 Frank uh, uh, von Hippo didn't say, uh, uh, because the, 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 the visual th uh, thing is that it is a black uh, uh, rock. Uh, it is disturbing. And people want to uh, remove it and not to see it anymore. And I can, I, I like that. On the other side, uh, Professor Morowski said that uh, we should uh, look at the natural attenuation as one of the major way, ways to, to deal uh, with the offense. It, it is, uh, we have a problem here. If you, if you want to deal with the visual aspect, we, have, we cannot wait for uh, the natural attenuation. I'm very much personally, I'm very much for the natural attenuation. So our eyes will suffer a bit, but I don't like to use, of course, not the steam, but uh, the, uh, the dis dis dispersants and the, uh, the bio. We're trying that today. We are making a, a small, very small scale experiment in, in order to uh, use them in the future, maybe, we just want to create the tools. We are not, we, we do not know yet if you're going to use it, probably not. My recommendation will be to uh, go into the natural uh, uh, attenuation, but of course, uh, the visual thing is, is, is important and we have to take it into account. Um, <coughs> sorry, um, I, I'm very much, uh, I'm worried about the, the uh, what, uh, uh, Frank said about the faulty and damaging uh, uh, cleanup. We have to be very careful in the ways that we uh, uh, clean the coast. The best way we use, uh, we use the volunteers, 15,000 volunteers. This is amazing, beautiful people, really. Uh, that came up to help us. They cleaned up most of the damage because we have three habitats, the water, the sand, and the rocks. Uh, the water, probably most of the uh, uh, of the oil is on shore now. Uh, so I, I believe that the water is quite clean. We have to make sure that there are not uh, uh, residual uh, chemicals in the water because I'm afraid that the, the larvae of the barnacles, my good friends barnacles, and the, and the fish and all the invertebrates uh, uh, were damaged and uh, the recruitment uh, to the uh, coastal environment is going to be, uh, the, the, in, the intertidal will be uh, very weak. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Uh, and I really don't know what to do with that right now because uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we know how to measure it and to deal with that. Uh, with the sand, uh, uh, most of the uh, beaches are clean because uh, the volunteers just went there and collected manually and we are using now heavy machinery together with the army in order to clean uh, the sand. So I believe that the sand, the sandy area is not a problem anymore because as we said about, about the scale. The last thing is the rocks uh, in the intertidal. I just went there to see if the barnacles are, cov are covered with, the, with tar. Most of them were not and they, uh, they were even active opening the uh, I forgot the name, they, 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 they open up and, and, and they were feeding. And, the, um, and, and uh, I, I was quite happy to, to, to see that, that it didn't damage them that, that bad. There are uh, parts of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the beaches that the tar covered uh, the, uh, the invertebrates along the coast, but fortunately enough, not a big part of the, uh, of the rocks are covered, mostly on, on the very high, uh, it's not even intertidal, it's, it's where the, uh, uh, the very high tide and the, uh, and the waves, the swells which are coming with the tar, uh, just covered with the tar. We have to, to see how well uh, we can clean it. But as I said, I believe that our major lesson, and we got here many uh, lists, uh, especially uh, in Professor Alexander's uh, Augustine uh, lecture, a list of things that we have to look at the, the, uh, next time. I believe that, well, 
we are going to have the next event. It's not, the question is not if, but when, but we have to be better uh, and prepared, taking the, all the uh, list of the things that we have to do, and uh, we'll do it better next time. And I think that this event, as I said, is over, but we have to be, make a lot of preparation in order to be better prepared uh, for the next time. Um, with that, I end uh, this uh, session. I thank uh, Professor Yossi Loya uh, very much and Rani Amir very much, and thank you for listening. Back to you, Tamar. Thanks to all speakers, and thanks, Shkedi, for stepping up on short notice. And we will move directly to Professor Noga Kornfeld Cho, the Chief Scientist of the Ministry of Environmental Protection, to lead the discussion of session three. Please, Noga. Um, thank you, Tamar, and uh, thank you all for the fascinating and uh, educating talks. Um, my main conclusion is that we still have a lot of work ahead of us um, to address the extent of the damage, facilitate coastal rehabilitation, to recover the environment and its uh, biodiversity. And we should also increase our readiness for future events, especially in the face of uh, new emerging threats such as the new agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Elat Ashkelon Pipe, Pipeline Corporation uh, to operate a land bridge for conveying oil between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and it's our role and we plan to do so. Um, over the talks, we received some questions from the audience and I will now present them to our guest experts. Uh, and in the meantime, if you have any further questions, uh, you're most welcome uh, to write them in the Q&A and I will do my best to, to raise them all. So uh, I'll start with some uh, questions. Uh, first question by Professor Bella Galil. Uh, Bella Galil actually addressed uh, the, the question to the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Uh, she asked, uh, uh, she, she wrote that the physical and chemical disturbances to the environment are followed by establishment of opportunistic and non-indigenous species. Israel already has the largest number of uh, non-indigenous species per kilometer coastline. What steps does the Ministry of the Environment Protection plans uh, to survey and document possible, uh, probable increase in non-indigenous species? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer in brief and then transfer uh, the question to our uh, experts. I'll say that um, we, we are planning to, to monitor uh, the coastline, um, including uh, invasive non-indigenous species. Um, uh, we're working on, on, on the uh, monitoring uh, plan right now. Uh, hopefully, it, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the ministry promised us uh, a budget for the monitoring, uh, but uh, as you all know, the budget is relatively small and I will be happy to ask our expert, uh, experts, uh, what do they think we should focus on uh, taking into account that the budget is, is, is limited? So- um, I'll, I'll try and answer if you, if you want. Sure. Uh, so, a um, uh, really good question about invasive species, and it's not a, it's not a foreign question for us. Um, in the wake of Deepwater Horizon, we saw an enormous explosion in the abundance of, of uh, Indo-Pacific lionfish, which escaped from the aquarium culture a long time ago and have been, you know, moving up the coastlines. Well, we think they actually exploited um, a niche that was opened for you know, the, the smaller reef fishes there. And so the lionfish actually came up tremendously in abundance, right? And, and it's highly competitive and predatory on the existing animals. And so um, there's nothing we really can do about it. You know, we try to get skin divers to, um, to shoot them with spears, but you know, that's a difficult proposition. Um, uh, so you know, from my point of view, you know, since you have such a nice data set about um, the relative amount of oiling, you know, per line of shore, whether you could correlate that in the future with monitoring for invasive species to see if, in fact, there's a relationship between invasive species abundance and community structure and 
the degree of oiling. I don't anticipate that that would be tremendously expensive. I mean, it's a matter of doing quadrat surveys and those kinds of things that along those shoreline things, but it sets up an interesting experiment, you know, to see if in fact uh, um, you disrupt these communities to a such extent that you actually create niches for invasive species. Good question. Can, Good I, question. Yeah. can I add my comment on the monitoring? Mm -hmm. um, on a small budget, I, I can appreciate that. One of the things that we tried to, with great success um, just a couple of years ago was to work with the oil industry on some of the biological monitoring and um, specifically on the offshore rigs themselves when they have these long pilings. And we worked with you know, biologists, marine biologists, worked to set up instrumentation along the existing infrastructure that's out on the rigs to be able to get deep uh, in, you know, deep water column um, uh, collections of, of various, various organisms and, and to, to monitor them. So whereas that would have been very expensive alone, mm -hmm. the cost of the data collection was substantially subsidized because the infrastructure was already there. And that was a collaboration with uh, Shell um, on, one of their, on one of their deep water moorings. So the, there's opportunities, I think, to really expand some of the monitoring and some of the data collection, um, even on a, on a limited budget, because I think that there will be a lot of agendas to align and if, if you can get people to work together and say, well, I want to do that too, and I have a ship going out, or I have a this, um, it can work. It takes some effort, but it can certainly work. And we have some models of where that worked well. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is maybe, uh, Rania Mir, maybe you can answer it best. Uh, the question is, uh, to what extent the Israeli National Action Plan is updated uh, and upgraded to such a disaster? And uh, when, and if and when it will occur in, uh, in the Red Sea in Elat? Uh, and what is being done now to ensure that we can monitor oil spills before they come to shore? Okay, the, it's a complicated question, so the answer is complicated also. Um, complex, not complicated. So uh, let me first uh, answer that uh, there is no really such thing as uh, ready because it is, uh, it is changing, it's variable. What is ready? Did the, uh, uh, the was the United States ready for uh, a disaster such as uh, we've heard uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in April 10, 2010? Um, some say uh, this was the worst uh, ever, uh, and the United States was not was not uh, as prepared as it should have been. Maybe uh, is no way uh, fully prepared. Some say it's the most country in the world for any oil uh, oil spill disaster but the question really is uh, depending so um, let me say that uh, on the positive side we have managed to create it's not an action plan it's a national contingency plan this is the term NCP national contingency plan under the OPRC uh, convention which Israel is a party to we've managed to create a national contingency plan which is a, a three-tiered response system uh, as in many, in many countries in the world. And uh, what we've seen uh, on the last, uh, during the last uh, period, uh, 30 days, we've seen this contingency plan work. It actually worked. The tier one, the, the first responders, uh, the municipalities, the volunteers, it's not a magic. Of course, the volunteers came in thousands, which is warming, it's great. But the system was in place. They had their instructions. They had uh, certain kinds of equipment. Uh, we had a well-prepared uh, uh, situation room which handled the situation in all uh, media. So, and this is the positive side. The also, also positive side is if we had the chance to go out to the sea and manage to, uh, and try to uh, prepare some, uh, or some containment, containment and recovery operations at sea, 
if the sea would have been, uh, should if the sea was calm it wasn't it was stormy um, then we would have uh, we would have, we, we would uh, be able to send out some uh, combating uh, oil combating vessels and ships to try and contain and recover some of the oil so this is the positive side the the less positive side is uh, is that we are not i feel that we are not ready we're not ready in several senses first um, the early warning um, the early early warning apparatus is not in place or may, maybe let, let me just be more accurate it's not fully in place okay we have some satellite images we have uh, some surveillance uh, aircraft but it's not fully in place and there's a lot to accomplish in this that sense we are very short in personnel in manpower we are the ministry of environment of environmental protection the marine environment protection division we are 33 people at service this is uh, merely enough uh, we cannot operate ships we cannot operate we cannot uh, really guide and assist the uh, local authorities when a spill uh, of, uh, of a worse kind uh, happens so uh, we should uh, at least double our personnel we need some more budgets we need to build uh, uh, response uh, stations equipped with more uh, containment and recovery uh, equipment some more oil oil uh, combating vessels uh, so in that sense we have a lot more to accomplish I can say another thing on the positive side is that and vis-a-vis uh, and, uh, -vis, uh, the question about uh, the Red Sea and the preparedness of, uh, of, uh, of uh, institutions such as uh, Katza, uh, those institutions are, are ready. They should be ready even more, okay? Especially in Eilat. Eilat is not ready. Eilat should be, uh, should be uh, uh, double, maybe even triple equipment and other means of, uh, of uh, oil response uh, equipment and, and, uh, and uh, uh, personnel. So there's a lot to accomplish in a lot. But if we talk about the Mediterranean preparedness, uh, this is a, a more calming uh, situation because uh, institutions and, and uh, private contractors are well equipped. The, the leg which is, uh, which is crippled is the governmental, uh, governmental leg, as I said before. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rani. Um, another question um, is, uh, is there anything that we can do uh, to improve or enhance um, the recovery um, of the biodiversity in the, in the sea? Any, anyone would like to answer this? Well, I, uh, you, you know, it's recovering what, you know, um, you really have to understand the damage assessment to actually understand what the scope for recovery is. And so um, it's one thing to monitor, you know, what the chemical pollution is there, but also to understand um, what resources are associated with it. And, you know, one of the strategies is to compare like coastlines, oiled and not oiled, to see you know if you can determine what the baseline conditions may have resembled, and that may tell you to what extent um, the the ecosystem has been degraded by contact. Right. One of the issues is going to be whether or not there's any ongoing pollution. Uh, you know, I was really heartened to hear um, Dr. Amir's um, talk about the. Um, the pace of, um, of beach cleanup, which is which is, sounds great. Um, but um, with beaches, and this sounds like the same situation, um, we know that uh, oil and particularly heavy oil and, and tar will mix with sand and it'll create basically asphalt at the toe of the beach, right? So it's at the, at the extent of the beach in the ocean where, where waves crash, right? And so what we found in the Gulf of Mexico is that when severe storms start, we still get oil, you know, um, tar balls, and these things that look like pieces of broken asphalt, which are basically this oil sand agglomerate, which is hardened yeah, and sitting at the toe of the beach, you know. So, and actually, there's been some fairly significant mining of that, you know, actually using bulldozers in the surf to bring up these and sometimes enormous, you know, aggregates. And so, uh, I think um, that may be an area to look 
for you know residual parts of this oil that are out of sight, but may create some longer term issues of tarball, you know, on beach things. And and of course, even after the BP disaster, BP had a crew out there, you know, on tarball cleanup, you know, because everybody knew it was their oil, right? So uh, um, I I think um, th there's it there's going to be some residual that will come up on, on, on in storms and, and uh, not to be disheartened about that. Yossi? Uh, for uh, damage assessment that Stephen is talking about, uh, we have to know what's, what is there before the spill in order to have damage assessment. So what I'm talking about is uh, long-term monitoring that is hard to get money for. If we don't have long-term monitoring in areas that we want to assess damage assessment, uh, nothing will help. We have to know what's there before in order to assess damage. Thank you. I could not agree more. And I, that's a cry for all of us globally. Um, Rani and uh, Shkedi, would you like to say something about the, the, the regular monitoring of uh, Eilat and, uh, and the Mediterranean shore? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, there are two programs. One we, we call the national program. Uh, I will open it with my camera. Thank you. Uh, the national program maybe uh, that is run by the Ministry of Environment that is done. Uh, maybe uh, Rani will, uh, will talk about it. Uh, and we are doing uh, quite a lot of uh, biological monitoring al uh, along our reserves uh, that will give us a, a kind of a, a start line how to compare uh, uh, the future um, uh, findings uh, uh, and, and, the, and the next ones. So we know uh, we have data on fish, we have data on algae, we have data on some invertebrates. So uh, we have a, a nice baseline it's not perfect, it's far away from being perfect because we started it only in 2015 and we are, it is still building up. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, uh, the baseline is uh, quite good. Uh, maybe Rani would like to um, emphasize on the, on, the on, the, on the other part of the national uh, plan. And I also like you to uh, read the Itzik Mokowski question about the, the sank oil and the, it's on, on the bottom of the questions. Uh, yes, Ronnie. Yes, uh, just uh, to expand a bit uh, on the national monitoring uh, programs, we have uh, two of them, one in the Red Sea and one on the, uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, in the Mediterranean, it's, uh, I think it's running uh, for almost uh, 30 years in a row. Uh, in the Red Sea, it's only uh, kind of 12 or maybe less years uh, old. Um, let me just say that it is never enough. You can always uh, monitor more, more stations, more parameters. Uh, it's never enough, especially when we are talking about Mediterranean Sea in the uh, economic exclu exclusive economic zone of Israel, which is uh, less monitored than the territorial waters. But uh, we have a fair good, uh, a fairly uh, good uh, information as regards the physical biota and chemical situation uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean, especially in the territorial waters, less in the EEZ. And we are working on expansion of that. Um, so um, yeah, there's always a place for more. In the Red Sea, as I said, the program began on 2004. Um, and uh, I think in terms of, uh, of uh, money, we are investing in each uh, around uh, 1.8, 1.9 million shekels uh, annually. Uh, and that's the situation. Thank you, Rani and Kedi. Uh, there's a question from Professor Itzik Makovsky. Makovsky. Uh, taking together uh, the thought that the Persian oil is heavy and that we are, that only the residues go to the shore shouldn't uh, we search for the part that sank down, and if so, how should we do that? Yeah. So I I think actually what's um, 
what's left when the tar is hits the beach are the lighter components and those probably uh, dissolved or were broken down in the water column so I would doubt very uh, heavily that um, you actually are going to be able to find because it seems like the heavy components came to the shore and so the lighter components probably dissolved or, or were uh, weathered. Um, and the last last question is from uh, uh, Dr. Omri Bronstein, uh, also from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, yeah, I had a comment before, uh, Noga, about that yes, yes. last question. I think that uh, we should remember always that the aromatic compounds of crude oil are the most soluble and most toxic and they can come out to very large depth. I had the experience of working in Buzzards Bay in Woods Hall at 20 and 30 meters depth, which was uh, there for a very, very long time and it affected all the bentos. So this is much harder to study and monitor, but definitely one should look at it. And not only, of course, what the public eye is worrying about, and these are the large animals, the fish, the dolphins, the sea turtles, and so forth. There is a whole lot of organisms down there that the public is not aware of, which are suffering from these toxic uh, compounds. Thank you. Uh, and the last question uh, is, is uh, an important question for Israel. Uh, and. Uh, Omri Bronstein is asking, uh, what do we know on oil pollution in the context of water desalination? 80% um, of Israel's drinking water comes from the Mediterranean uh, and such an oil spill could uh, uh, um, damage the, the, the um, quality of the, our drinking water. So we know it was tested in the current event but uh, as we heard, this wasn't a, a major oil spill and it was a crude oil, uh, but if it, was, uh, a, a, if it was a larger oil spill or a, another type of oil, it could damage uh, our drinking water. So I'll be happy to hear if you have any experience or knowledge about that. Maybe I can relate to that, Noga. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, for sure, definitely, this is one of the worst nightmares that we have nowadays. Uh, when we were talking about oil spill, uh, especially the liqu liqu liquid liquefied oils, uh, this is uh, it's going back to what I said before that we are we were lucky in this event that it was tar and tar uh, it tends to uh, go directly to the beach and not uh, and not go uh, into uh, into the intakes of. Uh, the desalination plants, which are located more or less uh, eight to ten meters uh, in water depth, so uh, but certainly when there are soluble uh, uh, and volatile uh, uh, the parts of oils, which are more uh, more problematic in that sense, then the desalination plants will be closed automatically. They will not take the chance because the migrants are very very delicate, very vulnerable to uh, such a pollution. And uh, having uh, bearing in mind what you said that uh, uh, about 60 to 70 percent of Israel of Israeli drinking water comes from the sea, this is definitely a threat. And uh, I can also share with you the information that uh, when the last uh, spill from uh, land-based, by the way, a land-based pipeline back in January 2017. There, were, there was a spill uh, from one of the uh, of one of the uh, pipelines, which held about 100 uh, cubic meters of uh, of heavy oil. But it was heavy oil, uh, which was uh, uh, it was very it was very light, and it spread and it shut down three desalination plants for three days. So that happens. Any comment from our experts? Or? Well, I, I think that the desalination issue and the, the ecological issues you've been talking about illustrate uh, the, the point that it's much 
cheaper to prevent ecological damage or health problems than it is to try to deal with it afterwards. And from the comments that you've made, Noga, it really sounds like Israel is under-resourced on environmental expenditures and, and monies to prevent environmental damage. Uh, and, and that's a political problem for Israel to solve because it's, it's so much so much more effective and better for everyone if the problems are, are prevented in the first place, particularly when you consider the um, accelerating offshore gas development that Israel is undertaking now. So it seems like Israel should really be having uh, a discussion about the resources the country is putting into the environment. And this is not the only environmental disaster in Israel right now. So uh, I, would, I would just say that, uh, you know, Israel is, has been thinking about security as, as a preventive issue for its entire history, but not on the environment. I agree. Okay, so uh, this was wonderful. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants, especially our guest speakers who shared the, their knowledge with us and uh, congratulate the Tamar and the Museum for this important initiative, uh, bringing together world leading experts in the field of oil spills and ecotoxicology. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, this webinar is the first of a series on applied environmental uh, science promoting a scientific discussion forum between academia practitioners and decision makers to improve the management and protection of Israel natural capital. And I hope to see you all in the next webinars too. And now for a few words from uh, Tamar. Yeah, I just join you in thanking everyone for their participation. It was really illuminating and important. And uh, thank you all for joining us in this uh, symposium. And I hope to see you in the next ones again.